My name is April Consolo. I am 23 years old. I live in Brooklyn, New York, and I am a barista, actor, and writer. Can you describe, or how would you describe, rather, your current relationship to work? To my, like, daily job yeah. work? Sure. Um, oh, I feel like any person in the arts is going to have a really complicated relationship to like their day job because there's always like this um, idea that it's temporary and or that you want it to be temporary but oftentimes it's not as temporary as you wish it to be Uh, but also it's what pays your bills it's what allows you to do your art when you can and uh you know, you invest a lot of your time into it. So it kind of has this complicated relationship where it's like, I want to do well at my job, at anything that I do. Um, But I also kind of hate it more so than other people may hate their day jobs because it takes time away from what I consider to be important, like what I want to be spending my time on. So even though I love my coworkers and my job isn't that difficult, Um, it does wear me out and it makes me feel kind of sad at the end of the day when I'm too tired from the thing that's supposed to be allowing me to do art to even, I'm too tired to do my art. So complicated. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there is a job aside from your art that you would enjoy more than the one that you currently have or do you feel like what you're doing is sort of the best um alternative to what you truly want to be doing so for money uh, for money so hmm i don't think that this is necessarily the best case scenario. Uh, It's an easy job in that like it doesn't take all of my brain power. Um, It doesn't require me to do things at home. I can like leave and leave it there. Um, So that's good, but it doesn't, it's basically like I'm on autopilot the whole time I'm there and that can be really like doling I feel like for your senses and for your brain in general and your emotions and all those wonderful things that contribute to art. Um, But I could definitely be in worse jobs. So there's a fine line between getting a day job that you enjoy enough that it's not like completely miserable um, without having a day job that you like so much that you are okay with basically not doing your art. I feel like if I had a day job that I enjoyed more, I would probably um, enjoy it too much and get too wrapped up in it and stop pursuing other things outside of it. So it's like you have to have that middle ground where it's like, I hate this job just enough Mm -hmm. um, that it inspires me to do other things besides that, but not so miserable that I'm just like coming home and crying and collapsing Mm -hmm. every day. Mm-hmm. only sometimes mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel like that um like the job that I have um I was worried that when I started I would get too comfortable in it mm-hmm. because going into it, it it seemed in some ways like a best case scenario just because like I came from working in film and working like 14 hour days and not being able to do anything else. So when I got a part-time job that was three days a week that would cover my rent and my bills basically and nothing else, but it would allow me to sustain myself, um, I was worried that I would get complacent in that and I wouldn't uh, continue pursuing other creative endeavors or trying to, I guess, monetize or... Um, like seek out anything further. Yeah. I felt like maybe if I got a job that 
was easy and comfortable that paid my expenses that um that i i would become unmotivated to uh make money from the things that i actually like doing but i i think like because it's not what i want to be doing even though it's not terribly difficult after a while i just sort of came back to feeling like i have in in past jobs where it's just like yeah i I don't want to be doing this i want to do this for as little time as possible so it actually i think in a good way um has motivated me to want to um seek out other opportunities Mm -hmm. but positively at the same time allowed me to to pay for what I need to pay for in the meantime. Right. Because I mean, at the end of the day, it it could take a very long time, many, many years for most artists to be able to support themselves with just art. And so it's, it's a necessity that everybody kind of has to weigh. And I know like a lot of actors are bartenders because of the specific hours, you know, you work all night and then you're free to audition during the day. Um, and I was worried with my job because being a barista, you only work during the day. And I was worried that it would kind of hinder some opportunities. But people make them out like they're going to be throwing auditions at you. Mm. Like, oh, I, I can't work during the day. I have mm-hmm. to only work at night no matter what like my natural sleep schedule is or what jobs are available to me because I'm, I, I have to have the whole day open in case there's an audition and like, I don't know how many auditions other people are getting. I'm sure more than me, but, um, I can definitely work around it. Like my job is flexible enough that if I did have an audition, I could switch shifts or even like take the day off if necessary to fulfill them. And I just feel like people limit themselves on what they see as like an acceptable job like oh it cannot infringe in any way on like my acting time but like your acting time is going to change all the time like you might get cast in a film a short or something or an episode of tv that only shoots at night and then like what are you going to do um so everybody's situation is different and I think that more so than responding to like the ideas of what an actor side job should be like you should look more to who you are as a person um because there's a lot of people that do like secretary work or they nanny or um they serve or like what whatever is going to benefit you the most as a person something that's going to allow you to have morale for the job that you don't have yet I feel like it's really easy to get um discouraged and tired and um disillusioned so whatever job will allow you to enjoy yourself enough that that doesn't happen to you you know I think that's what you should do um and everybody needs to survive everybody needs money but not everybody can make money off of their art immediately so yeah how do you feel about the idea or the concept of working for an hourly wage um just (laughs) in general as a as a culture or as a society like the the way that we sort of frame labor and exchange our time in our in our efforts for money um do you have any thoughts about that or it do you kind of feel like that's just how it is and you have to work within that? Um, do you ever question it or do you ever feel like maybe there should or could be a different way of, of going about making a living? Who, um, it sucks (laughs) for sure. Um, so I have to clock out for my half hour lunch at work. And every time I do that, it just makes me so angry because it's like 
seven dollars that they're saving every time that one of us like clocks out for lunch and that's like one drink that we make out of like the hundreds that we make every shift um so i the idea of an hourly wage especially minimum wage which is what i make um which is 15 an hour uh which is more than i've ever made before but the idea of, of working for minimum wage really gets to me sometimes because it's just barely livable. The idea of like a wage that you can pay someone and they will just barely be able to like make it off of that. Like that calculation is so insane to me that we even came up with something like that. Like, oh yeah, if they, if, if they don't get sick if they don't get into a car accident, if they don't get hurt, if like nothing goes wrong, you can live off of this wage. But like life doesn't work that way. People get sick and they get hurt and their car breaks down and their kids get sick and their spouses get sick and have to be out of work. And there's just so many other things that go into life. It's not just like, can people pay rent if we pay them this much? Yes. Okay. Minimum wage. Boom. And in a lot of places in this country, that isn't even true, especially for tipped workers. Um, a lot of my friends are tipped workers and they'll make like $5 an hour, which comes out to basically nothing after taxes. Um, it's just wild. Like just the idea of like who, who came up with that like number, um, and how can we be expected to survive off of that when we don't have a great health care system at all and if people have to pay like $400 for parking on the wrong side of the road? Like things, the system feels like set up for you to fail when you're living like that far down on the wage scale. Um, but so many of us like exist right there in that kind of teetering position between like, I'm okay and and I'm not going to be able to make rent this month. So many of us are just like one, one day away from that. So I like to imagine a world that, that doesn't exist in, (laughs) I like to imagine a world where people can pursue whatever they want and contribute to the world just with their talents and their skills and their ideas and um, their hearts and not what do I need to do to eat dinner tonight? What do I need to do to send my kids to school? What do I need to do to take care of my parents? Our priorities are just so messed up. Like there's no reason in a world with this much excess for so many people to um, be living in a world of survival. There's just no reason for it. Um, So I like to imagine that we wouldn't need this, but I also can't come up with a solution. I I don't know how we would structure society when we're so entrenched in capitalism, when the divide between like the poor and the rich is so large, it just seems like uncrossable. I don't know how we would kind of bridge that gap. Um, And it seems like our current solution is just to trust that the rich will be generous and that they'll like voluntarily give their wealth away, which some do, but like never to the extent that it's even that it's even like a a large amount to them. Like it, the idea of like giving a hundred thousand dollars to a charity just sounds so like not ridiculous, but um, unreachable for so many people. But there's a handful of people at the top that like wouldn't even notice that that much money disappeared. So when they give that to a charity and make a big stink about it, it just makes me so sick because it's like that's two hours of profits for you. It's nothing, nothing to you. So yeah, I just, it's, the system's broken. (laughs) I don't know how to fix it. 
I daydream about being rich, basically. Um, that's the thing. I, like, I definitely buy into the system. Like, I want to be rich. I want to make money. I want to make a shit ton of money. And it's hard to, like, um, justify that desire against, like, what I know to be right everybody wants to think that they would be like the one rich person that was actually a good person and like retained their humanity and gave everything away. And, um, but like the truth of the matter is, is that it, I, I think that w the sacrifices and the decisions that you need to make to like get to that point would you, you, by the time you got there, you wouldn't be thinking the same way. You would be a different person. Um, so, yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but it sounds like you have a desire to be rich or to have money that really stems from um, just wanting to be comfortable or wanting to be able to afford a lifestyle that you want, not necessarily for the status of being a rich person right yeah but because you know what it's like to not be rich mm -hmm. the way that the world is structured it would just life would be easier yeah i mean i don't think there's anybody that wouldn't want to have a lot of money um even if you're one of those people that's like no like i don't need money i don't need like a, a secure home I, I don't need any of these things like that's a privilege in of itself in order like to be able to say that I feel like you have to um, have not experienced certain things to say that you would like refuse to be rich. Um, just because like there's so many people in my head that like I could take care of. Like I could take care of my parents and my grandparents and my siblings and even like my friends. Like I could support their art and I could like there. Uh, it's the it's not so much the idea of like just having money in the bank, although like there is sort of this crazy exhilarating like almost like uh like drug like feeling like when you get your first paycheck and you like see that you have like oh I have a thousand dollars in the bank right now um just like that that idea of like possibility of like what it could be um even though like in New York your rent is a thousand dollars so really it's like you have no money in the bank but just seeing that figure there's an exhilaration to it but it's not so much about that it's more about the idea of like what is the possibility that like this number affords me um mm -hmm. the freedom and the rest and the um yeah the comfort that having a certain amount of money in your bank account would allow you and it's like that same feeling on christmas when you like give your friends and your parents and everybody like their presents and they open it and like you were able to afford them like that moment of joy I feel like if if you were rich you could just do that all the time <laughs> and that's such an incredible um crazy idea that you could just be like hey mom your house is paid off you don't have to do that anymore it's okay like I did that for you don't worry about it you've done so much for me like thank you now now not only like do I experience that freedom and exhilaration but like she she gets her freedom she doesn't have to work a job that she hates that's like destroying her body and like all these things um that makes her exhausted she she is now free to like pursue what she wants to do it's all about freedom I think that's really like what money represents to me freedom because of security and safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting how money now that a lot of people are not handling cash on a daily basis, like money to us is really just like a digitized number on our phones or oh, on I the internet. Oh, I think about that all the time. Yeah, because it, it in theory, it, it is the result of the work that you've put in or the investments that you've made or, mm -hmm. you know, sales that you've made or whatever it's there's a a cause and effect behind it but but when you say i have a thousand dollars 
it really just means that your banking app says 1000 yeah but you you especially with like direct deposit and things like that like you're not seeing a physical representation of that money mm-hmm. um and i don't know if i have any deeper points than that but well it's, it's int- just a, yeah. yeah it's interesting um so i my coffee shop is in soho in manhattan and um we have quite a few uh I wish there was like a more elegant way to say this, but like really, really rich people <laughs> um, that frequently like come in every single day, you know, and and uh, they aren't all necessarily rude. A lot of them are very friendly, but like there's just something so sickening to like watch this person that probably has, you know, more money than I will see in the next 10 years in the bank, like pocket the quarter that I give them back and change. Um but I just think it's like cash feels more real. And so like, yeah, if they only have like a $20 bill in their wallet, they're like, I just, they're like more likely to like pocket that quarter maybe. I don't know. I try to think that it's for some reason that like physical cash is harder to give away. Um, but also, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just think there's no excuse. Um, Because luckily, even though I am a tipped worker, I still make full minimum wage, um, which is not the case for a lot of tipped workers. But yeah, it's it is it's crazy to see someone like put one dollar bill back into their like Louis Vuitton wallet. (laughs) Uh, There's a very like specific rage that I think um, minimum wage workers especially tipped workers like feel when you have to see that like a hundred times a shift um just seeing someone that is so far removed from your situation that it doesn't even occur to them that you might need that dollar more than they do um and maybe it's because they see you more as an equal they assume you're making more than you actually are, uh, maybe, or maybe it's that idea of like, I worked hard. I had to like do all of this, you know, for 20 years to like get myself to this point. Like all of my money is like my money and this $1 every day would add up and like, I need to be smart with my money. But like the, the reality of it is, is that like if a dollar disappeared from their bank account every day they would not notice the only reason that they do notice is because it's a physical dollar bill leaving their hands every day Mm -hmm. or not leaving their hands right do you feel like it it's possible to get to a place of wealth by working um not even necessarily for minimum wage but working by the hour hmm What do you mean by like wealth? Like how would you define this? Like like I guess whatever your idea, what whatever your um mm-hmm. monetary aspiration would be, do you feel like you could get there or anyone could get to that level of safety and security simply by just showing up to work and clocking in? I think in certain jobs you can. Um But I think that those jobs often have um, costs that aren't necessarily seen. Um, I know that like high danger jobs, uh, I I think like like construction people, people that like clean windows on like the 76th floor, uh, uh, even people in film in this industry, like when you're building dangerous sets or when you're lugging around heavy equipment like yeah you could probably make a really solid amount of money um something that I would consider very comfortable by working these jobs but you're also sacrificing a lot of your health and a lot of these jobs also have the reason that you're making so much money is because you're working 
you know, maybe 10 to 14 hours a day, uh, or you have to do a lot of work at home, or there's some sort of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, even like, like doctors that always have to be on call, or nurses that like work the night shift, you know, you, you have to, or super specialized um, scientists or doctors, you know, they had to go through like 10 years of schooling and their 10 years of in debt. Um, so yeah, you could probably make a bunch of money with these sort of jobs that we think of as like clocking in and clocking out. Uh, but I think that there's, they're a lot more complicated than that because you're giving up a lot of the times you're like peace of mind or good rest or time with your family. You're giving up your freedom in other ways to be financially secure. Yeah. I think that's interesting. Like you can, yeah, you can get to a place of financial security, but in a lot of cases you're trading your entire life. Entire life. For that. And yeah. then when you get to that place, is it worth it? Is it, you know, is there ever a point, I guess, besides retirement where you can stop and enjoy the benefits of the time and effort that you've put in for yourself? It's really crazy to me that like our healthiest, strongest, um, years of our lives are spent in the workforce and for a lot of people there's no point where they can take more than a few weeks off at a time uh it just seems so backwards to me like okay now that your body is starting to deteriorate and you aren't as useful to us anymore um now you can rest. Now you can take a break. Granted, you'll be living on like the scraps of what you've been able to put away during the time that you were in the workforce. Uh, so you won't even have that freedom that you did. It, it's it's so backwards. It's all like a series of contradictions. Like, oh, you have the money to go on vacation. But if you do go on vacation too often, then like, you might get fired or you won't be given certain projects. Um, and I think of my dad who has like accumulated enough paid time off that he like wouldn't have to work the last year that he was like at his job before he retired. And in theory he could be paid for like that whole time. Um, and that's awesome kind of as like an accomplishment, but that means that he's like not taken that week like ever for like the past 25 years or something like that. Like why, why Mm -hmm. wouldn't you, um, like when you're 35, like why wouldn't you like go to Australia for a month if you've like accumulated that month? And the whole idea is that like, um, in taking care of ourselves, taking our sick days, taking our paid time off, taking our vacation days, um, or even just saying no to super overwhelming projects or saying no to staying late because you want to go see your family, making those, um, sacrifice, not sacrifices, what the company sees as like a sacrifice or it, it just gets turned into you not being the best worker because you're deciding that, sorry, like my life, remember that? my life that I'm living it's more important than like this job and yes this job is supporting my life but you you don't owe that to them just because they're giving you money you what you do at work that's what you're doing to deserve the money not all this extra bullshit that people expect you to do um like take your paid time off, take your vacations. And if people are going to like penalize you for that, I just can't, it just so doesn't seem worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you're, you're like, again, back to my dad, like we're, his kids are all kind of scattered to the wind now. Like we're all adults getting us all together at the same time for a family vacation. Like it's just not going to happen the way it would have when we were kids. 
and we never took vacations, you know, because he could never get off work. So it's like we had the time in our lives for that. And the time was like set aside for him to take it. But he knew that if he did that frequently, that he might be passed over for like um, promotions and that sort of thing. So it's just it's a very odd um there's a lot to consider always right it's with like benefits. you don't not only do you have to be the best employee mm-hmm. but you have to be better than the best yeah and it's like who stays late who comes in early mm-hmm. those are the people that are going to get noticed not who always shows up on time and mm-hmm. works until the end of their shift it's like right. that's not good enough we need extra unpaid hours um and we need your we need you to be now you have to always be like accessible by phone too. Um I know this isn't like a, a revolutionary idea, but like like everyone's on Slack and I'm like, please leave me alone. <laughs> this mm-hmm. is my day off. Um and at my job there's like a really strong pressure to like pick up people's shifts when they can't make it. Um, because we have very few employees. So it's like that guilt. Like, would you want to be left like short staffed? No, of course not. Um, but maybe have more than eight people working for you so that that never has to happen. Uh, it, it blows my mind that you can have like these huge companies that, uh, just refuse to hire enough people so that, you, you know, you can, but also on the other hand, like there was a while where I was working 38 hours a week and just barely, you know, clocking in under like under full time. And so I would get there 10 minutes early, like I'm always supposed to. And they're like, no, like not yet because it would add up, or, you know, or, or like make sure you like leave on time for your lunch or whatever. Um, to make sure that you don't hit like that 40 hour mark. And it's just so, it just seems so stupid to me. Uh, like, yeah, you might have to pay me an hour of overtime, which is like an extra $7. Again, like is a company really that pressed about paying someone $7? Whereas like for me, I'm like $7. That's lunch. Great. Or that's, or that's like a little bit more going towards, my taxes that I, you know, where I actually get to take home more of my paycheck. So it just, it it's so wild to me that like, you're going to keep all of us just under the full time mark. I've had this issue a lot more with like previous jobs. Um, but you're going to work us all like 38 hours, have no full time employees. And, uh, so we don't get benefits, so we don't get the paid time off and the sick days and all those other things that they're required by law to give us. But there's no law to protect those part-time workers that are essentially working a full-time job. Yeah. It was crazy when I started my job. Like, within the first week, I, I felt obligated to to stay late. to Ooh, Because yeah. I only work three days a week, so... Mm-hmm. but they're also understaffed and there's a lot going on. So there are times where they ask me, can you come in on Tuesday or Thursday? And I really did not want to, but immediately because these people are my superiors, I guess, or have authority over me, Mm -hmm. I've sort of given them that authority by, agreeing to work for them right um Mm -hmm. but yeah they're not even necessarily people that i like but i want to please them because i am the employee and they're the employer so it's just it's a weird psychological um situation that takes place and i feel like it's ingrained in everyone like for sure. Just for, I mean, from, that's what school is for. Mm-hmm. The idea that like school is just to teach you to respond to authority. Um, <laughs> in yeah. like a, a, um, in the way that is expected of you. I read this thing, I think it was on Twitter, but someone just said, 
anytime a job says that we're like family here, it means that they're going to like emotionally manipulate you into doing way more than you're supposed to. Right. Um, and I think that really like encapsulates a lot of minimum wage jobs because everybody is struggling, you know, like you're, you're all making the same amount. All of my coworkers are like, you know, also either artists or students that are eventually going to become artists. Um, and you're all working towards the same thing. So like, of course you want to help them out. And companies know that you're not doing things for them. You're doing them for your coworkers. Um, and you're like the managers that are like closest to you in rank. Like that's, those are the people that you, you really are going to listen to and to care about their opinion and like work extra hard for, um, you're not, you're not doing it because like you just super love like Walmart or wherever you work. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe a handful of people do, but I don't. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't love Walmart. I don't love Walmart. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Walmart is like, there's, I could say a lot about Walmart actually. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. Not right now. (laughs) But yeah, a lot of these issues that we're talking about with minimum wage workers Mm -hmm. um, didn't like necessarily start with Walmart, but Walmart had a huge hand in um, kind of laying the groundwork for these uh, kind of ideas. Like they really implemented them um, just by being the biggest source of income in a lot of a lot of like smaller areas, more rural areas. Um, so yeah, I blame Walmart. Mm -hmm. Which is insane for such a, a company that could probably pay every one of their employees enough for them to live on for the rest of their lives at any given moment. Yeah. But they're sort of just stringing them along because they need people to work for them. Yeah. But what's crazy is, I mean, you also want to give people incentive to work harder. And I feel like that's what a lot of companies don't provide is any extra incentive for that extra work. It's just Mm -hmm. like you work here, so you're going to go above and beyond no matter what, no matter what you get in return. Yeah, I mean like the carrot that they're kind of dangling for most people is becoming a full-time worker, Um, which is why it's so important to keep the vast majority of your employees at part-time because like you don't get any benefits. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like what people are like working and hoping for is really just benefits because in this country, healthcare is linked to your job. So, um, and healthcare is such a huge important part of life security um i would almost argue it might be like the most important part of life security um so yeah they're they're dangling this carrot in front of you of like you could have these benefits that would allow you to live comfortably but only if you work here full time and so we need to see that you're like a loyal above and beyond type employee Um, And it's not only just like your effort, it's like sustained effort. It's like we need to see that you're going to keep working here for a long time. So even if the job is detrimental to your health, mentally or physically, or if you don't necessarily like it, it's like, well, I've already put in like six months. If I put in another six months, maybe they'll see that like I've, you know, I've been here for a year. That's like a solid amount of time. Uh, So maybe then they'll like bump me up to full time or they'll bump me up to salary, or they'll bump me up to like whatever promotion that you're hoping for. Um, it's all about loyalty, um, and it's crazy because like you, they evaluate your loyalty towards a company that ha- that it's a it's it's an entity. It cannot have loyalty back to you. Um, right. It yeah. can only it can only choose or not choose to provide you with the resources that you can take care of yourself. Like a company does not take care of you. They might have like a fancy coffee machine and like donut days and they might have like casual Fridays and all these things that are supposed to like, (laughs) I don't know, boost morale or like show that they are 
we're human too. But like, no, they're not. It's a corporation. It is a, a, a bulbous entity of people that don't know you and don't care about you and only know you as like a name on a computer or like a number you're 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 nothing to them right um but they very strongly require loyalty from you um and again i love my job (laughs) um (laughs) i really uh admire some of the people that are in higher up positions um i think that they're like kind of unique in in the way that like they have a kind of like it seems like a moral code um this is more about other companies that i have worked for and uh just research that i've done and other people that i've talked to but that being said um any job that you have that is part of a bigger entity um, where it's not just like this is the only store that like exists or like or this is the only thing that exists. Um, anytime it's a chain of any kind, uh, there's going to be people making decisions that affect your life that don't know who you are. And so they're never going to necessar- necessarily like make the best decisions for you. They're going to make the best decisions for themselves and for the other people in the boardroom <laughs> that they're with, you know, because they're also working for their coworkers. Their coworkers just aren't the people that are like running the cash registers and stocking the shelves. Their coworkers are the ones that have their own beautiful offices and that sort of thing. Um not to say that these like extra hours and uh 24/7 accessibility like that's that's expected of you at a higher up level as well, you know. Um, it's expected of, of everyone that we need to like owe our entire lives to our jobs, which is just insane. Um, I don't know how anyone can like be happy when you're living your life for like a, a corporation. (laughs) It's so punk. How can you be happy if you're living your life for a corporation? Um, But it's true. Like, if you're not making decisions because they feel right to you, but because they're necessary for survival. Right. I think about that a lot, too. Like, how much of what we do on a daily basis is dictated by the need to make money Mm -hmm. or by whether or not our activities are lucrative. Mm Mm-hmm and how different everyone's life would be on a daily basis if they were making decisions more so based on their, I guess, their happiness or even just their interests or even the interests of people around them. Because a lot of times you may want to be there for someone, you might want to provide help to someone that's close to you, but in order to survive and in order to be there for them in the long term, you have to make the choice to, to go to work rather than uh, to offer that help to them in the moment. Right. Um, but yeah, it's just wild that when we wake up every day, most of what we think about is how can I make enough money to survive? Mm-hmm. Or or to be happy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that a- after a certain level, maybe like once you kind of get a- out of like minimum wage world, it, it, it kind of shifts over into like the idea of happiness instead of survival. Um, like where I think a lot of people like our parents age um kind of lived because they had like kind of a better economy going on than we do um yeah it was about like how much money do i need to make to live the life that i want to live and uh if you wanted to 
you know, maybe live in a more rural area or even like a suburban area and um, live maybe a quieter life. Uh, maybe the figure wouldn't be so high. But I also think that uh, we grew up being told that we could be anything. And it was just about our skills and our talents and our work ethic. And I, I definitely really took that message to heart and it definitely formed like my some of my core belief systems but the but the reality is that it's just not true um I was born into like a privileged enough position that it is kind of true for me um but for most people it's not it's it's a lot of their circumstances are dictated just by you know their status that they were like born into or um the education level that they were able to access or like who's depending on them you know even if like you might have been born into like a more privileged privileged position if all of a sudden like a parent requires you to like support them as well or a sibling or a child um that's gonna change your your uh you're gonna go back into the survival mindset instead of the happiness mindset um, because suddenly like someone else depends on you and those things are so far out of our control that it isn't just about how hard you work or how much you work on this skill or how much you want it especially in the arts they love to talk about like how much you want it who doesn't want it like if you're pursuing something like that you, you want it enough that you could probably do it happily if your circumstances allowed you. Um, I don't know where I was going with this. Basically, people like to think that it's easy enough to like get to where you want to be if you just work at it and like put the 1,000 hours towards it or whatever that is um but it, it's not it's just not true 10,000 hours 10,000 hours dang here I was thinking I was like getting close <laughs> 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 I was like ooh, <laughs> <laughs> only 200 more to go <laughs> um <laughs> 10,000 you're right whoops yeah but some people don't have 10,000 hours to spare because they have to feed people and house people and clothe people that depend on them uh and also god do you really need 10,000 hours to like do something that you enjoy for money like not necessarily um I think it's more about becoming becoming an expert after 10,000 hours not necessarily making it sustainable as a career right yeah but I guess you could look at it either way yeah, I just I think the the idea is that even artistic jobs expect you um, to dedicate your whole life to them. Mm-hmm. Also, like they're you know, if a professional actor like takes a year off, people are like, do they not care anymore? Mm-hmm. What are they doing? Where are they? Do they exist? Do they exist anymore? Sorry. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Like like wh- <laughs> Just because they're providing a service that you enjoy you know, their face and, and their, their art. And in the case of actors or like putting out books or whatever it is that you do, um, you still get to have time to yourself and you still deserve vacations. And like, uh, a lot of actors will not make enough money to like solely survive off of that. So like, yeah, you have to like go back and forth between these jobs. And like, that's, fine I think that I think about other countries and like how the vacation is considered like necess- necessary for life like it, it's considered like a, a, a right in certain places I don't know why I'm thinking of like Italy but like maybe it's like a stereotype of Italy that it's like no like rest is important and enjoying your meals is important and family is important and like um, it's just crazy that none of the, all of the things that are actually important that have been proven over and over again to contribute to like happiness and health and 
um, long life and all these other things are just like discarded in the pursuit for money, Mm -hmm. which is supposedly supposed to make your life so much better. And it can. It can. But only to a certain extent. Right. And, you know, should it require so much effort to get there? Right. I I mean, you should. Yeah. You should be able to have vacation and family time and also make enough money that you're not stressed during that time. Um, That's the thing is that like stress is like an accepted part of our lives now. Like, oh yeah, everyone's stressed out, especially in New York. Oh, everyone is so stressed out. They come into my, they come in to get coffee from me and they're just like so stressed. And like, I just don't, I, I, it's like, it's manufactured. It's manufactured not only by their employers, but like by society, you know? Like if you're not stressed out, you're not working hard enough. That's wrong. Hmm. I just think it's wrong. Yeah. Um, w- we shouldn't be stressed out all the time. Not everyone should have like an, like literally disordered anxiety. Um, it's crazy. It's really just like such a, um, such an odd like thing to hold up as like, well, are you so anxious that you like can't sleep or breathe or enjoy any of your downtime? Great. You've made it. (laughs) Um, it just seems so skewed and backwards. Like, I don't know. I don't know. How do we fix it? I don't know how we fix it. I have no solutions whatsoever. I I think about it a lot. And I mean, I have a very limited life experience. I'm 23 years old, barely, and uh, (laughs) haven't lived a lot of life. But I just, I, I, it's like unfathomable to me. I, I just can't figure it out. I can't figure out like what the compromise is. It seems like so much of it is like luck. Like, oh, have, like, like family money to fall back on so that when you need to switch jobs, you can. Or have money to fall back on so that you can, like, do the job that you want and there isn't that, like, sickening stress of, like, will I be able to make rent this month? Will I be able to pay my medical bills? Um, it, ju- it just seems like it needs to... The, the answer is, like, have money already. <laughs> uh if you don't want to fall victim to the cycle. And so many of us are just not lucky enough to have that. Yeah, I don't have any answers. Hmm. (laughs) So let's transition now. And can you tell me a little bit about what you enjoy doing when you're not at work or what you would sort of the things that you fantasize about doing while you are at work, what you'd rather be doing? Mm. Uh, (laughs) a lot of the times it's honestly just sleep. I am always thinking about like taking a fat nap when I get (laughs) home, uh, which sucks. I, that's, Ooh, that's like one of my biggest gripes with like minimum wage jobs is that you do start fantasizing about like dinner and sleeping and oh man tomorrow i'm i'm just gonna take a nap and like watch a movie like that it 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 makes um very basic easy things in your life just sound like a fucking dream uh so a lot of the times it's those sort of things but on my days when i have a bit more uh energy and motivation um I'll think about scripts that I want to write, especially because you you get a lot of really interesting peeks into people's lives when they come and get their coffee from you because it's such a short, um, like, blip of their life. It's like 5 to 15 minutes. So they really include you kind of just in their lives. They, like, don't take a break uh, that's that short. You know, a lot of people don't get off the phone. So I hear a lot of really interesting phone conversations 
um, it always makes me laugh when people are like on these calls and they like they have their phone to their ear and they're like, yeah, yeah, just like tell them we just need a few more orders. Like it's it's going to be fine. It'll be here in a few days. Almond latte. They'll like l- they'll, like whisper or like mouth what they want. And I'm mm-hmm. like in full voice like. Do you want a small or a large? And then they're like, just as much. Like, just like this weird (laughs) whispery thing. And I'm like, just tell the person you're on the phone with to hold on for five minutes or the 30 seconds it takes just to order. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just so funny to me. Um, And I mean, funny as in like, I think it's disrespectful, Uh, (laughs) but also amusing. So you get a lot of, sorry, working back to my point, you get a lot of peaks into people's lives. And that's very inspiring, I think, for artists in general, um, but especially writers and actors, people that kind of mimic life a lot. Um, I love watching people's mannerisms, the, the way that they like order their coffee in the exact same cadence every day, but they don't realize it because it's just one sentence that they say every day. Um, but I, that's the only sentence I hear them say. So it's like, it, it, um, I think there's just a lot of interesting peaks into people's lives. So it inspires a lot of scripts for me or scenes or like if I, like I'm working on a play right now and sometimes I'll hear somebody say something to like their partner and I'm like, wow, oh, that's so interesting. Um, I want to like take that. But of course, like you can't have your phone or a notepad or anything out. So like you just try to hold on to it. But I I know so many observations are just lost to like the mindlessness of your job. But in theory, that's what I'm thinking about. Not all the time, though. Can you describe if you if you were fully rested Mm -hmm. and you had a week off, how, how do you think you would spend that time? Hmm. I'd love to like get outside. Um, it's winter right now and it's very cold, but also I frequently go into work early, early in the day. So I miss like mornings and I really love being outside in the morning um so I'd I'd like to take a lot of walks lay in a lot of parks um read for pleasure I'd like to see my friends that I don't really get to see because of like conflicting work schedules I'd like to have a drink without worrying if it's going to like give me a headache when I have to open at 5 30 a.m. I would I want to go to the library. I've really been wanting to go to the library. I loved going to the library as a kid. Reading has been like one of my most consistent loves of my life and I would just love to go to like a beautiful quiet building and look at books <laughs> um i would like to say that i'd like to travel i mean taking a week to like go to some place warm sounds just absolutely perfect to me right now but um probably couldn't afford it if i'm being honest so i think i'd just like to explore the city more like do things that might take a little extra time, something that like might take my whole day um, as opposed to the few hours that I have before it gets dark when I get out of work. The earliest that I get out of work is 2 p.m. So um, you only have like two and a half hours of daylight after that. Don't have a lot of time to do things unless you have like a full day off. And um, so nature books sleep restaurants exercise 
all the things that make life worth living, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to go to like, um, like outside of the city or like the edges of the city. I feel like I just go back and forth between like lower Manhattan and this area of Brooklyn. Like I, I don't really explore a lot, so I'd like to explore. Am I being specific enough? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, and your aspirations mm-hmm. are to spend more time acting yes. and writing. Yes. And hopefully turn one or both of those things into a career that mm-hmm. can allow you to do those things full time and not have to worry about working elsewhere. Yes. <laughs> oh, it just, uh, it like gives me chills to even hear it said out loud, but yes. Can you talk a little bit about when you first started acting or when you very first found acting as a creative outlet? Yeah. Um, so I, guess I told my mom when I was like a toddler that I wanted to be an actor and then she was like okay do you want to go to acting classes and I said no um (laughs) could be in a very different place if I had said yes I guess um but yeah I always wanted to be an actor but I just didn't do it for the longest time like I never did anything as a kid um but I just always said that I wanted it and I I loved movies. I've always loved movies. I would like memorize whole scenes of movies and then like perform them for my mom or my siblings, uh, or even just like back at the TV. Um, but when I first started really acting was in high school, I took acting one Because like I said, I always wanted to be an actor. So I guess I had to start at some point. And I did and I loved it. And I took one class. And then from then on, it was like any class that I could take at my school that had to do with acting or dance or or any sort of performing arts. Like I was taking it. Um, And so I would take like 10 classes a week because I had to take a full academic class course load and then I was taking a full um performing arts course load as well and I would do shows like after school I was just like so um so energized about it because I was finally doing this thing um so I I was like yeah I'll go to class from like 7 a.m until 3 p.m and then of course I will rehearse until 10 p.m. and and still have all this energy that's the thing that is so incredible to me is that I always say like I feel like I don't have the energy for these creative pursuits but when I actually am doing them I have so much energy um I'm I'm just like enlivened if that's a word um like I, I just feel I all of a sudden I do have the energy to do them because I am doing them when art is your like feels like your life force it's kind of um interesting how you can just kind of spiral out of it if you stop doing it at any point you know you kind of build it up in your head as like this thing that takes so much energy and it does but like you forget that the motivation to do that thing like comes from doing that thing Mm mm-hmm if that makes sense. Yeah, it takes a lot of energy, but it's it's giving you the energy. Exactly. Like it, it propels itself. Yeah. Um, but if you lose that either by graduating like me um, or just like a shift in career or something like that, if you kind of stop doing it for a certain period of time, it can be really hard to start up again. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like going to the gym. Like you always wonder how people can get up and like spend an hour at the gym every morning, but it's because like that hour... <laughs> like pushes them through the other 23 uh it 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 it, it's a cycle um so you just have to like start the cycle up again and uh that can be really difficult Mm -hmm. to do when when uh especially in a field that's like this competitive especially for actors because writers you can always like make yourself sit down and write um even if someone's not paying you but as an actor it's like like what do you do you like sit down and like do a monologue at the wall uh or you like try to gather like like it requires someone else 
unless you're just doing a monologue at the wall. But like you need a scene partner, you need someone to film it or you need like people to watch it kind of to like feel that whole experience. Um, you need other people. And so that can kind of make it very easy to make excuses for why you're not doing it because like, oh, I don't have actor friends or like I don't I don't know anybody that could film this. Like I, I don't know. And um, it's easy to make excuses and kind of fall out of it once you're not in like an academic environment, for instance, where you're like constantly uh, presented with opportunities or people that are all like desperate to do this thing. Mm -hmm. Do you have any notion of what attracted you to acting in the first place? Maybe not when you were a toddler, but (laughs) coming back around to it in high school, um, was it just something that you recognized that you liked or... Was there something, some specific feeling that it gave to you or something specific that you felt made it feel purposeful as a way to spend your time? I think it just always moved me so much. Watching people do it, you know, movies always moved me (laughs) so much, um, I was always so invested in them. They seemed so exciting. Uh, It's just, it's a chance to like experience parts of life that would never be accessible to you. I think. Um, It really is a way to explore emotions that you may never have like properly processed or, or, um, expressed not as like a a therapeutic way necessarily I kind of always cringe away from people that are like acting is my therapy it's like my way to process emotions like no do that on your own time bro like uh being an actor is like not an excuse for being um a human being that uh is not emotionally intelligent I think that actors are supposed to be the most emotionally intelligent people. They're supposed to like constantly be doing like almost therapeutic work, breaking down their own responses to things and where they come from and and just being super self-aware. And I think that that uh, dissection of humanity is what drew me to it. The idea that like, oh, I can figure out why I, I feel this way or I can observe so much more of the world it seemed like something that was going to force me to be aware at all times and just kind of like suck everything out of life that I could get um yeah it it seemed like and and it also afforded me the chance to like bring uh joy and catharsis to like more people than anything else I could think of and I liked it. You know, I, I also just liked it. I love the process of rehearsal. I love when you do a take and you're like, oh, that worked. I know it worked. I like feel it. Um, there's like such a, a, a personal competitiveness. It's a team sport in that everybody has to work together. So you have that sense of camaraderie. But at the end of the day, you're only competing with yourself. Uh, it just has so many aspects of it that I really love and that kind of feel tailored to me specifically. Like my personality really thrives when I'm acting all the time. I feel most myself when I'm acting and writing all the time. Can you describe maybe a perfect day or a perfect week that you can envision yourself living Mm -hmm. in the future once you've reached this point of making acting or writing a sustainable career, um, what do you envision um, yourself doing on a daily basis or what would be your ideal of of a lifestyle at that point? Hmm. See, I guess the th- one of the things that um, draws me to it so much is that I wouldn't really have like a daily routine. 
Uh, because I feel like there's so many variations on this. Like it could just be like, I wake up early and like make a little breakfast and then I go to set and like have a great day on set. And then I, you know, hang out with my coworkers and everything goes smoothly. And then I come home and I go to sleep. Like that sounds like a perfect day. Um, but so does like, I just wrapped filming and I get to like actually rest because I, like made enough to support myself during this time. And so now I'm hanging out with like people that I didn't get to see. And I, I get to travel with my partner and I get to do all these other things. So let me think, let me see how I can like kind of combine them. Okay. So, so I wake up and it's a sunny day. We'll say spring, because that's my favorite season. And I make coffee for me and my partner. And we just talk about maybe what we're going to do for the day. You know, just something like quiet and simple. And we eat breakfast. And then I leave to go for a walk, maybe to the gym, because in this future, I uh, frequently go to the gym and I work out and then I come back home and I shower and I prep for a rehearsal, go over the scene, maybe, you know, run lines or just like mark it up with like some ideas that I have. And then I leave to go to rehearsal. I get there and everyone's on time and everyone's in a good mood and excited for the day and then we have a, a rehearsal and we really explore and we really push things and it just it's one of those rehearsals where everything just kind of like feels like it's clicking it's one of my favorite feelings um and we get through everything we're supposed to get through and then we all leave and then I come home and I get changed and I talk about it and uh then I go out to eat to a restaurant with just an abundance of gluten-free options and vegan food and it's all delicious and I get to pay for the meal because at that point I'm just financially secure and I can do that sort of thing frequently and it feels good and it doesn't feel stressful and then maybe we go for a walk like through the city and then we go to a bar on a rooftop and we meet some friends and everybody gets along somehow even though they might be from different friend groups and it's beautiful and you can see the city and I don't know, I feel like there's just this sort of warmth that you get from like a big group of friends and everyone feels that. And I feel successful and happy and then everyone scatters to their homes and I come back to my home, which is warm and clean and decorated to my taste. And it feels very much mine. And then I go to sleep. Yeah. And everybody gets free tickets to my show. <laughs> All right. I think that's a good place to end. All right. Thanks for doing it. Thank you for having me. This was great. <laughs>